hi guys welcome back to my channel or if you've not been here before welcome to my channel we have fun here i like to think um today we've got a nice cozy setup which if i'm being fully honest i don't know how long will last because it was actually warmer than i expected because it was raining outside and it was really cold all day today but then i set a fire on i got my dressing gown on because i had a vibe for this video i was gonna make a hot chocolate and i was like i think if i made a hot chocolate i might die of heat so we'll see how long we can stay here but this little video is a sort of general q a but with a primary focus on my autism my autism diagnosis journey what's happened since then sort of thing so fun little sit down chat video today not the standard for my channel um but i figure First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey because I posted a TikTok a couple of weeks back now about things that I thought were anxiety and turned out to be autism. And it did really well. It got 160,000 views and a lot of people were commenting with questions and sort of wondering about my journey. And I figured, well, if they're wondering, give the people what they want. And what I want because I I do love talking about it so yeah um with my autism where do I even well I feel like I should give a bit of background so when I was a baby I had cancer actually um and I don't really remember it so it doesn't really affect me too much um but it's relevant I promise and then when I was nine i think my parents got divorced and then i had a couple of instances of bullying in school so you might be wondering why am i bringing all that up it's more to like set the scene of kind of why mine and my family's headspaces were more and therapists i guess more on anxiety as opposed to neurodiversity um so i would say i was always a bit of a shy child quite emotional very like I felt things big or yeah I kind of a lot of the time there wasn't necessarily a medium with me I if I love something I love it with my entire heart if something upsets me it's the worst thing in the world in that moment um so I kind of had, was all that growing up and did struggle with friendships like I would say I was sociable um as a child but I definitely had anxiety surrounding socialising and making friends and I remember writing in my diary, it's it's kind of maybe worth digging up if I can find it, like I don't know why it's so why people don't want to stay friends with me. Um so that was kind of me socially and I'm trying to like think my mind back because I, I think since my diagnosis I've had to do a lot of like or not had to, but I've chosen to become very retrospective and sort of view things in the light, like putting on the autism lens and seeing it. Um, but yeah, so I kind of never really was a big fan of going out. I was always described as a homebody, introvert, separation anxiety to my mum. She would talk about, um, she tells a story about how... Um, when I was younger and being dropped off at nursery, I think it was, I would scream and cry and kick and not want to go. And she was speaking to someone and they said, tell you what, why don't you sneak in later on and you'll see that she's happy as anything. And <laughs> my mum thought, good idea, because you know that's the case with a lot of children. They kick against going in, but settle in once they're there. And apparently she went in and saw me and I was bawling my eyes out. And I feel like that sort of set the precedent for my schooling, actually. And I think that's mainly where I had most of the issues. When I was 10, I started getting very severe panic attacks. Um, and that was with uh, coinciding with my parents' divorce. And again, so we, to us, that made sense, you know. Well, you know, she had a big life change. And parents, divorce, panic attacks. Um, I remember my first one really vividly, my first two, because at the time I didn't know what they were, 
Um, the first one wasn't too bad. I remember just kind of saying to my parents, I feel like I can't breathe. I'm worried I'm going to die. <laughs> and that... And then my... That was actually just before my parents' divorce, I think. Um, and then my second one was afterwards and I couldn't breathe, gasping for air. And I was genuinely... I remember thinking, this is, this is it now. My mum... My mum didn't... Oh, I'm going to get a dog in. Hello, baby. You're going to show your face because it looks like I'm talking to no one. Yeah, my mum at the time didn't know what it was either. It was, I can only imagine a very frightening thing to see your child go through. And yeah, she, we ended up going to A&E because we thought I was having an asthma attack. And they kind of said, no, like it's, this is anxiety. And that was my first, oh, I've got that. And I would have them once in a while when things were particularly stressful, um, but nothing, nothing crazy. And then it got to GCSEs and I got a kidney infection that led to me missing my mock GCSEs. And it was a big deal. I had to reschedule all of this, have to do all of them my own. And I ended up, because of my kidney infection, taking a good long while off school and I'd never, I'd always been a bit anxious surrounding school. Like I'd watch my sister in particular go in incredibly happily. And I was like, that's not really me. It was fine. Uh, but after I got that illness, it was a case of, I cannot bring myself to go in. I genuinely would have panic attacks thinking about going in. I was at this point having three panic attacks a day, terrible ones that would leave my muscles aching and so tired that I would like sleep after. And that was a really, really bad time because I couldn't do anything. And and I had actually at that time quite a good established friendship group. And I remember just not being able to describe. They were like, why can't you come in? And it was like, I don't, I do not know. Like, what are you afraid of? I have no clue, but I cannot go in. It was like we had school gates and we would be driving and I'd be kind of, silently panicking but then it got to the point of the gates and something physical would happen in me and luckily I have the most supportive family um my mum was very keen for me to get back into school but very understanding and I took a lot of mental health days worked with some therapists to try get myself back in and I was eventually sort of able to go back in but I think that was the real turning point where I was like this isn't how everyone feels um my life shouldn't be this hard school shouldn't be this hard especially since I love learning I've always loved learning if it's something I'm passionate about I absolutely love to learn I love new information so I was like something's not matching up here but I was like it's anxiety I've developed anxiety it's terrible but it's okay um from that point I was unable well I think I've always been a bit like this but because it's hard to tell but I did not like being in enclosed spaces and that's not necessarily in meaning in small spaces it was if I'm sitting in a theater I need to be on the aisle seat or cars begun to really stress me out and it was anything that felt out of my control just I couldn't I couldn't do i flying traveling all of that and again it's so important for me to say I've always been a bit like this it was just kind of more showing and yeah and I managed to go back in and I kind of got through the end of year 11 and then year 12 sixth form I was really lucky in the school that I went to they were incredibly accommodating and in sixth form obviously I don't know you know what it's like for everyone whether this is universal but um we I didn't have as many lessons in a day and we had a system where we had um a room that was shared with one other person and it was like a mini like it was kind of like a boarders room but like they'd call it day rooms and it would just have two desks in and in your freeze you could go there and I found that structure worked a lot better for me I could kind of sit myself through an hour lesson and then go have my own space do what I want but again there were still struggles with stuff like friendships meeting up with people was really hard for me and I was beginning to really struggle in classrooms where I in any situation really where again I felt I couldn't leave and it put kind of a strain on my friendships because I couldn't just attend meetups um and 
I couldn't really do much and I couldn't I couldn't articulate it and I think that was the hardest part because it's difficult if someone doesn't seem to want to meet up with you all the time or are saying they're anxious to spend time with you it's difficult not to take that personally I think so you, I really have to like understand that from their perspective that it was hard for them because I was their friend and yet I wouldn't spend time with them but anyway year 12 was sort of okay like I said accommodated a lot and then COVID hit and I was suddenly thriving which is not what you hear people say very often but I love the fact that I had structure in the times of online lessons but that I was at home and I was in my environment and I could have my lunch and I could have because that was another oh I hated lunches at school especially if I didn't have a friend to come with me in lunch like if they had a different lesson first period and I had to find my, my own way in and meet them and I was like what table are they at like isn't this gonna be so awkward when I approach what if I'm late what if I end up eating lunch on my own all of this going on in my head and yeah COVID hit and I was doing great and then schools came back and the one thing about covid is it did not help my health anxiety and also meant i was very out of practice with socializing and so returning to school after covid oh, it hit me it was terrible my mental health just plummeted and i essentially really struggled again with attending year 13 really really struggled and I remember that was the point where I started thinking I've been seeing therapists on and off for years now I'm not getting better and I was sort of coming to a point of accepting this is always going to be my life I'm always going to struggle with friendships um, because that got worse in year 13 I'm always going to I'm not going to be able to do things I love because I think that's the thing that potentially differentiates anxiety a bit is it was with things I really wanted to do that I just couldn't do and I would get overstimulated and all of this and it just was never (laughs) entered my mind to think beyond anxiety anyway and I was then getting to the point where I was like obviously having to apply to unis and I was like it's either a gap year or uni like I knew I wanted to go to uni I knew I wanted to have that option and I thought because my mum was so for me taking gap year and I thought if I don't go to uni now I'm never going to go and I really pushed myself and I I refused to apply to anywhere close to home because I kind of took an approach of exposure therapy I was like maybe this is just because I'm not trying (laughs) maybe I am just you like stuck in my ways and so I picked the furthest uni from me and I was like if I can do this I'll cure my anxiety (laughs) that was my thinking at the time and very soon reality set in being away from home do I want to do that um and so the struggle continued and again I will say the the actual structure of uni worked a lot better for me um I made really good friends that were very very supportive very similar to me didn't mind if I was cancelling um would literally I remember I I made this one friend Evie you've seen her in my vlogs and well if you have seen my videos before um and she kind of knew a bit about what I was going through and was always really understanding and I told her once going into a lecture because we both did psychology told her once I like to sit on the aisle because yeah that's that's literally all I said and I think she understood it was more than just personal preference but then we met I met another friend and who also did psychology and she walked with us one time and started choosing a seat and I was panicking because I was like I don't want to have to explain that I'm weird in wanting an aisle seat because I'd never heard of this being an anxiety before and Evie without me saying anything just goes oh we like to sit on the aisle seat (laughs) just an example anyway so uni I really really struggled being away from home I ended up coming um coming back quite regularly I would say once or twice a month 
coming back and having that set I struggled with everything being away from home um missing the dogs missing my family having to deal with all these overwhelming and overstimulating things on my own and socializing like I would be in the kitchen and I'd be socializing and I'd suddenly just be like I do not want to be around people anymore nothing to do with the people but I was suddenly like I have nothing left to say I don't want to be here I hate everything I'm really stressed I want to go lock myself in the room and never come out again at that point though I'd started weirdly developing a fascination developing a fascination with neurodiversity um didn't join the dots if I'm being honest I was in therapy again in my third year for just kind of even when I was home it was getting really bad I couldn't leave the house uh because I was just overwhelmed just anything being away from home felt unsafe that's the only way I could describe it and this was the first therapist to mention to me she goes we were actually talking about my room funny enough and my inability to keep my room tidy and she must have made a link between that and something else and she was like have you ever considered ADHD and I went no (laughs) but I am now and I went and I did my research and I knew that it presented differently in girls because I'd researched it anyway just not in respect to myself and I decided sure let's pursue a diagnosis here and I went for a screening I went privately I want to make a point to say that and also a point to say that I am not unaware of my privilege there I really want to emphasize that um I know that the NHS is in absolute crisis with neurodiversity. I know how hard it is for people to receive diagnoses. And so I just really want to highlight the fact I am so grateful and so aware of my privilege in terms of private diagnosis. And they said, definitely a possibility for ADHD, not a chance of autism. But I had felt, I remember coming away from that and I felt a bit like, even though autism wasn't even on my mind, I was like, but they didn't ask me any questions, really, that would indicate whether I had autism or not. Because again, I'd done my own research, and I remember thinking about that just from a sort of third person. Hmm, that's a bit of a weird thing to do in their screening, like, is not ask relevant questions, I guess. Anyway, and I came away, and my mum was a bit confused about the autism thing, and I was like, okay. And I decided not to do anything about it. Oh, I think this was just before my third year, actually. And I decided not to do anything about it because dissertation, all of this. And I was like, I can't be dealing with going for an actual diagnosis now. Um, I also just didn't really know how to feel about it. I finished up my dissertation and I began having discussions with my mum. And I was like, I really feel like there's something to this neurodiversity Uh, argument like I just do not feel like my brain works the same way as others I feel like I have a hundred million thoughts at any given point like when I was going to the theatre it would be the case of making sure I have everything prepared what time is the train where can I sit on the train what if the train's really busy what if I have to sit next to someone on the train okay when we're there where are we going to eat what am I going to eat when we're there and when we get there like am I in an aisle seat can I leave and then I'd be sat there and I'm like okay it's better to leave if we're seeing a musical during a song because no one's going to notice I'm leaving all of this like just my mind was moving so fast and I just thought I don't know it just feels like it's all a bit harder than it should be and my mum had started floating the idea of autism and she was like it's worth considering essentially and I was like girl please no (laughs) because like a lot of people I had stereotypes about what autism is um and it's important to know that it can be these things like um the examples that come to my mind are like uh in the show atypical um the good doctor sort of those that was in my mind and I was like well I'm I'm not like that I'm different to that I can I yeah and I don't want again I don't want to knock because that's good representation for people whose autism is like that but I just wasn't seeing myself in any autistic representation essentially um and that was until recently which I want to make a point I'm floating around a bit but geek girl I thought that did a blooming good representation of autism 
uh, in girls particularly, I enjoyed that. Anyway, um, so we started like really pursuing the ADHD diagnosis. We were trying to find people and I knew I wanted someone who specialised in girls because I knew how hard it was to get a diagnosis as a girl and I'm the type of person that if I'm told no you don't have it I don't advocate for myself I'm lucky that I have um, a family and my mum in particular advocates for me massively but I knew when I'd heard stories about people having to go for like two or three diagnoses I knew I didn't have that in me so I wanted basically to cover all my bases get someone who really really knew what they were doing so that if it was a no it was a no and if it was a yes it was yes I guess equally two of the people we were looking at sites they had their own pre-screening um and I did it and I did for ADHD and I did it for autism to appease my mum and suddenly ADHD was coming out quite low and autism incredibly high and I was like how weird and my mum was like I think you need to get tested for autism my love and I was like and I'll be honest I did not want to and I for a while, and I, I really want to be transparent with you guys, I couldn't stand the idea of receiving a diagnosis of autism. Even though I was an advocate for it, even though I'd done my dissertation on it, and I knew how important it was, and I knew in some part of my brain it wasn't what... Like, it was so much more than just what I was seeing on TV and, and other things. But I did it. I, I went for the diagnosis, and the second I joined that meeting... And she started asking questions. I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, I've got it. I've got it. I've, I'm autistic. And again, in full transparency, I hated it. I was so upset. I came off the call and it was a really long, exhausting call. And I just like, I said to my mum, I've got it. And then I didn't talk about it. And I told everyone not to tell anyone because I was like, what does this... I, I think my two main things were, what are people going to think? And does that mean this is me for the rest of my life? Does this mean I'm never going to be able to do the things that I want to be able to do? And it was really, really rough. I went through a lot with that. I was miserable for about a month before I suddenly was doing more research. And I was like, this just explains me. <laughs> And I feel like the real turning point for me was, I can't remember where I was going. It must have been a theatre production. And my mum said, let's apply for an access card. And I said, absolutely not. Essentially, I'm not sick enough because that was my mindset with that. I was like, I'm not sick enough to receive special treatment. But my mum was like, you, I promise you, you will benefit from this. We applied and then we booked a show and my mum goes, oh, like, um, my daughter's got an access card. Suddenly it was a case of what does she need? Immediately we have these aisle seats that are reserved specifically for this. And I was like, this is a thing? People need aisle seats for it? Like, what? And just, I felt so... I was allowed to like big crowds, which had always stressed me out. Like I remember traveling um, in the airport and I was in the security queue, literally my worst fear, and having a hysterical meltdown because there were too many people, there were too many noises. I kept on thinking, do I have to take my laptop out of my um, bag or do I not? Do I have to take my shoes off? Do I not? Like I have to go through all this on my own. What if they pull me aside? What if they take me off into a room and I'm left to do this all by myself and all of this and suddenly, no, 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 no crowds, all of this. When I went in Gatwick not too long ago, it was like, oh here, go through this side. We have specifically for this. You don't have to hang around and be overwhelmed by cues. And, and I started validating myself more. Like I would wear my loop earplugs out and suddenly I was calmer in um like restaurants I was happy to be there I would wear them in the theater so that the noises weren't too loud um or on trains or anything like that and so not only was I being accommodated I was accommodating myself since then I have 
really it sounds so strange but I genuinely feel like I have been on such a journey of self-love because in both retrospectively and looking towards my future I feel so much compassion for past me and how much I managed to get through without these accommodations without this understanding and I think people underestimate just how much just how important it is to feel understood by yourself um and looking to my future now I'm like there's so much more I can do like I'm going to do a master's now and I have had a chat with a neurodiversity team about how I can make my experience more enjoyable so yeah that's my sort of journey so, yeah um so I hope you guys have enjoyed this video if you have any questions I do think I'm going to do an actual Q&A soon I've really enjoyed having you guys here and uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe, comment any video, idea, video ideas that you would like to see and yeah, happy to have you and happy to see you and thank you for spending half an hour or so with me.